Oh, kia ora e te whanau. Chess. The game goes back apparent, apparently about 1,500 years or so, and if you've ever played it, perhaps it even feels like it takes 1,500 years or so. Uh, and if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's played by these two, um, you know, two opposing uh, players sitting uh, normally uh, opposite side of, of a checkered board with specially designed pieces normally in black and white. And the objective of the game is to ensure that your opponent's king can no longer move. So you, you know, take the opponent's king and you place uh, him or her in a checkmate position. And when you get to there, it's you know, game over. And between the beginning and the end of the game are a range of tactics that people will use. And, and all these pieces have different uh, ways of playing. They have different abilities, and so they are sort of like different values um, around that. So on your seat is a bookmark with a small amount of those uh, chess squares on there. Uh, and a chess piece, take that in your hand. I want you to kind of think about this chess piece that you might have had. Some of you uh, might have... Uh, a knight, the, the one that looks like, uh, well, the one that kind of is a horse, you know, knight on, on the horse, so you know, worth, uh, you know, three, uh, three points because the, the knight can go like two piece, uh, you know, it's like L-shaped, you know, a crooked way of, of playing. Uh, some of you might have the, the bishop that goes like angular across the board, uh, also worth uh, three points. Uh, some of you might have uh, the rook, uh, which is over here. So we have, uh, you know, going these like straight lines across the board worth, I think, five points. I'm looking for John because John is like our chess expert around here. I'm a bit nervous today because I know I'm going to get something about chess wrong that is going to correct sometime during this. Uh, and then, of course, uh, some of you might have, have the queen, which is worth nine points. The queen's, you know, got pretty much free reign across the board. And then, of course, you have the king. The king doesn't actually have a value. Uh, some would say uh, the king has infinite value. Because, of course, if you can't move your king, if the other you know, player gets your king, effectively, checkmate, game over. And, of course, most of you have the most common piece on the board, the pawn. <laughs> Worth one point, often seen as expendable in the game. It's often how we feel in life, isn't it? You know, if you have the pawn, it's like, Ugh, I'm nobody. You know, the great Forrest Gump once sat on that park bench in that famous movie and mused, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. To which somebody has responded, life is like a game of chess. I can't play chess. <laughs> and the reality is that, uh, you know, you're, on this, that you're placed on this board of life and oftentimes it feels like you have no idea how to play. Uh, you, you're on this, on this game of life, and you're trying to work out how to move, where to move, and it feels like the pieces of the opposing team are stacked up against you. And the opposing side, they seem to have this, like, this vast army at their disposal with all like, these amazing tactics to win, and your pieces, you, you know, your pieces have been taken out, uh, and, and you're, you're feeling like thin on the ground, and it looks like checkmate is coming, and just a move or two, it's, it's game over it's coming soon, and it's your move. And you don't have the resources, you don't know how to play the game, you're just one person, what can you ever do? Ever feel like that? Your kids are going in a direction that's not healthy, there's so many voices now and wider culture that are, are seeking to influence the next generation, and your voice seems muted in their lives. Uh, what can you do? Uh, the conversations in your workplace are horrid, you know, values and morality are, you know, kicked for touch, and, and you're just one person in your cubicle trying to work your way, just trying to get on with your job. I mean, what can you really do about the craziness in your work culture? And, and then in society, you know, values are changing significantly. At one time, there was like this, this basic moral framework that we all largely ag agreed on, but now that moral framework of society has largely gone. Uh, at one time, the, the Christian voice was heard and somewhat respected. Now it feels like there's a strategy to cancel that voice out, to remove us from the board altogether. And it can feel a bit scary at times for followers of Jesus. So how do we respond? Uh, how, do we, how do we move? What's our next move in this game of life? So all, all of these questions direct us to a Bible book called Esther. 
And one of the many things I love about the Bible is the way it speaks to the issues of our day and provides effectively this, that this compass to help us navigate through the challenges that we face. And, and if you ever feel like you're just one move away from being placed in this checkmate position, well, that's certainly how the people of God at the time of this book felt as well. The events uh, that occur in the book of Esther take place about 2,400 years ago, and they take place in the empire of Persia which ironically is very much part of the origins of the game of chess as well. But there's a problem. You see, the, the Persian people who were in charge didn't have the same values and beliefs and perspectives as the people of God. And, and decisions are being made that have no regard at all for the people of God. And, and throughout this book, we're going to see you know, things like a, a beauty pageant, a power games, attempted genocide, And it all sounds more like a game of thrones or the house of cards. It certainly doesn't sound like a story that you would expect to find in God's word, the Bible. And of course, if you're living through all of these scenarios, you'd probably be wondering, well, um, where is God anyway? I mean, does he have a role in our lives? Does he have a role in society anymore? Maybe, Maybe he's in charge over in Jerusalem, but here in Persia, we're just like one or two moves away from being in a checkmate position on the losing side. We're not on power. What can we ever do about it? Each week, we're going to be looking at a different character in the story, effectively a different piece on the board. And today, we want to begin by looking at the king. His name's Xerxes, and his story takes place in chapter one of Esther. And we talk quite a lot about him. This is the way the story begins. Uh, These events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Ethiopia, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and nobles of of the provinces, 127 provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days. A tremendous display of the, the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. Our history tells us this feast is likely the great war council that took place in the year 483 BC. And and Xerxes was was planning a a Persian invasion of Greece, the only other superpower in the world at that time. And Xerxes needed to gain the loyalty of uh, of, of his guests that he had at the party in order to overtake Greece in order that Persia would be the only superpower in the world. And so the purpose of this banquet is to make sure he impresses his officers, effectively buys them off, so they're going to be on the same page as him. And so he brings them together in a six-month-long party. And during the entire 180 days, we're told the Xerxes displays his opulent wealth and the splendor of his majesty. And then guess what he does after the six-month banquet? Well, he holds another one, as you do. And this one's extended to the common people in the kingdom. So we read in verse 5. When it was all over, the king gave a banquet for all the people, from the greatest to the least, who were in the fortress of Susa. It lasted for seven days. It was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. And we're given some details about this you know, long feast and then this seven-week feast that shows off, the seven, you know, it shows off the extravagance of the king's wealth and power. Picture the scene courtyard was beautifully decorated with white cotton curtains and blue hangings, which were fastened with white linen cords and purple ribbons to silver rings and better to marble pillars. Some of you who love interior design are really looking in on these details. A gold and silver couches, we're told, stood on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, uh, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Uh, Drinks were served in gold goblets of many designs, and there was an abundance of royal wine reflecting the king's generosity. By edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking, for the king had instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he wanted. So you can picture the scene, no restrictions, no restraint. Everybody drinks from uniquely designed goblets of gold, uh, you know, free uh, bar tab on for everybody as long as you want. You can picture the scene. This is party central, the party of the century. Already we're learning a whole lot about King Xerxes. Uh, Politically, Xerxes was a great ruler. Uh, You can't ignore the influence he has over the globe. Uh, Globally, he was one of the superpowers. Uh, We're told his kingdom extended 127 provinces. 
from Asia Minor all the way down to Africa, uh, then across to parts of, of India. Uh, you place that on a map, it looks like this. Huge, huge area of our globe. He is a global superpower. And remember, the purpose of this feast is the planned invasion of Greece, the only other superpower that existed in the world at that time. He's after world domination. Then economically, he has vast wealth. Uh, we just read about you know, the year and a half part, or the, the half year party that showcased it, quote, a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and pomp and splendor of his majesty. In a Kiwi translation, it would just summarize it to say, he's loaded. <laughs> he's filthy rich. And then culturally, <clears throat> he was majestic and regal. Remember all those details about the white cotton curtains and, and blue hangings, faster to silver rings embedded in the marble stone, uh, and, and then the, the gold and silver couches, uh, the bestoke gold goblets with the best of wine. I mean, utter extravagance in culture. It's incredibly powerful king politically, globally, economically, culturally. But, but at the same time, Xerxes has horrid character flaws. I mean, two already come to mind right here in the story, don't they? Uh, Xerxes, number one, was self-indulgent. In many ways, this six-month-long party mirrored his own life. No rules, no restraints, no restrictions. This is how leaders like Xerxes like to operate things. Self-indulgent. Uh, he's also showy. We've already seen the way he liked to show off his vast wealth, his vast power, but the story doesn't end there. Uh, we t we're told that um, uh, on another day of this, this feast, uh, when he has, like, no doubt, you know, taken people on tours around the palace and showcased his media room and showcased, you know, everything that he kind of has around there, he's kind of out of options. He's got nothing else to show. So then he has this idea. It seemed a good idea at the time. We read this in verse 10. King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine. He's under the influence. He told the seven eunuchs who attended him to bring Queen Vashti to him with a royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty. Now, I think we're all kind of uh, mature enough to realize what's going on here. He's not showing off her brains. You know, Vashti, can you come and deliver a lecture on the latest developments of nanotechnology? No, he wants Vashti to come out so all the guys can gawk at her, his trophy wife. And so the king invites his queen to come and parade herself. But something unexpected then happens in our story. Vashti says, no. Uh, come parade myself before a group of men who have been drinking nonstop for who knows how long. Yeah, nah. You know, so she sends a note back to the king to say, yeah, um, I don't think so, thanks, but no thanks. Now, I'm guessing Xerxes has never had anybody ever say no to him in his life, at least not to him directly. Uh, and he's wanting to look fabulous before all of his guests, but she's making him look foolish in front of his guests. So how does he respond? Well, we read. This made the king furious, and he burned with anger. And so he gathers his advisors around him, and he says, well, you know, you guys have probably heard the word no before, so what do I do? Because I've never heard this word. And his advisors escalate this to be a worldwide problem, and they say to him, king, if, if word gets out about Vashti, then all the wives and the whole empire will rebel against their husbands, you know, crises. And, and so this uh, calls, you know, these so-called wise guys, passes edict that uh, allows, you know, this says Vashti is no longer allowed to come to the king ever again, which, to be honest, probably doesn't break your heart at all. And they expect the following result in verse 20. When this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. So let's use like political power to force respect. Yeah, that's going to work. I, I mean, where do these wise guys come from? Now, at this stage, the king has no wife. And so once again, he gathers his, his advisors around him to come up with a solution to find a new trophy wife. And we read, next chapter. So his personal attendant suggested, well, let us search the empire, which is massive empire. Let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. The young woman who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. 
This advice was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect. You can imagine it. A new government agency is set up. Let's call it the Department of Beauty. And its agents are sent out to gather the best-looking girls from around the empire, and they put them through a rigorous beauty treatments, lotions, perfumes, you, you name it. I mean, not just talking about like 15 minutes or even 15 days. We're told that these girls have a whole year to enhance their beauty by, you know, um, whatever they can do to their bodies, whatever they can do, uh, you know, with what, what they're wearing and with cosmetics and whatever it is. And they learn, no doubt, as part of that, every seductive art possible to do with sex. And all this is to get ready for one night to spend with the king. And all these young women are meant to compete for the king's affections. Uh, The king is going to choose one of all of these women or girls. I guess he's going to find a rose and give it to one of them as a way of saying, I choose you. It sounds a bit stupid, doesn't it? But nobody would ever think that anybody would ever do this. But yeah, there's some similarities here to The Bachelor, isn't there, in our story. But there's also a really big difference too. You see, these contestants aren't coming by choice, they're gathered. Uh, We might say the word trafficked. You see, Xerxes has no regard at all for what the girls think or want in any of this. It's abuse at the highest level. Uh, After all, you know, that the dreams and desires of these girls are completely irrelevant to Xerxes. They're simply pawns in a world of powerful men. And women have now become expedient to whatever dream and fantasies Xerxes might have for his own life. And so Xerxes spares no expense to prepare these women for one night in his bedroom. And whichever one of these girls pleases the king the most is going to become the new queen. And the ones that don't make first prize are going to spend the rest of their life in desolate seclusion. Uh, They could never leave to go back to their family. They're going to remain as part of the king's harem for the rest of their lives. A large harem would obviously boost the king's image from here on in to, to help him be seen as powerful and successful. Now, they're the king's chattels, property, position. So start kind of thinking about King Xerxes again and who he is. Powerful king, but we know self-indulgent, shall we add to that list, hot-headed, an abuser of power, a sexually deviant womanizer or trafficker, easily manipulated by his advisors. There's one more we can add to the list horribly cruel. Later on in our story, we're going to see that his 2YC by the name of Haman decides he wants to exterminate a whole people group known as the Jews. Uh, Haman throws a dice, he uh, known back then as a lot, and he chooses a date for their extermination, for their genocide of their whole people race throughout the empire. He, He goes to King Xerxes with this massive bribe, the amount equivalent to GDP of Persia at the time, no doubt funded by taking all the property, all the possessions of the Jewish people that he's about to exterminate. How do you think Xerxes responds to that request? You know, he doesn't even bother to ask who the people group is that he's about to consign to destruction. He sees the money and he signs a genocide death notice and straight after this he sits down to another feast while the people throughout his empire are fearing for their fate. You see, Xerxes' character flaws presented here are shocking. But we're not just told about Xerxes in the biblical story. We can find out about Xerxes in historical data outside of the Bible, which shows that women weren't just pawns in his universe, but really everybody was a pawn expedient for him and his pleasure. In fact, the Greek historian Herodias wrote a book on the history of Persia just 25 years after the reign of Xerxes, a really early book. And he reports that 500 boys were taken from Babylonia and Assyria every year and castrated in the Persian court. 500 boys every year. You see, everyone's sexuality, male or female, was at the king's disposal. And Herodicus also speaks about how how one day you could be really good friends with Xerxes and and everything would be going great in your life and then all of a sudden he would just like turn on you without warning. In fact, he tells a story in the the history of of the wars of Persia and he says, uh, Pythias, one of the leading officials, offered Xerxes a large sum of money to pay for one of the Persian military campaigns. Uh, Xerxes was so overwhelmed by his generosity that he refused the money and was so um, you know, overwhelmed, refuses the money, and even gave Pythias a present instead. 
A little later, you know, uh, Epithius came to ask Xerxes if his son could be excluded from military service. He'd already lost a couple of sons to, to previous wars, so, you know, it seems like a, uh, you know, uh, okay request. Uh, Xerxes responds, though. Uh, he, um, he calls the son out to the front line of the army, and he orders that the boy be cut in half, and then he marches the army between the pieces of the boy just to make a point. See, what we're seeing here is that the Persian court was not a safe place because Xerxes held great power and he used it unpredictably, making decisions from sinister motives, often with impaired judgment under the influence. And he swayed easily at the whims of others, happy with anything and everything as long as it doesn't affect his personal agenda. Xerxes is the king on the board. In his mind, all the characters of the board exist really for all of his dreams and fantasies to be met. This is at a time when a person's value is measured by the size of a wallet or a waistline. It's a time when your brand or your image became more important than character. It's a time when culture upheld this ridiculous standard of beauty that pressured people to undergo beauty treatments and surgeries and shopping sprees to look good at whatever the cost. It's a time when it was all about getting ahead whatever the cost to climb the corporate ladder to amass as much wealth as you can. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that such a time ever existed. It's hard to believe that the human race ever descended to such depths, but apparently there was such a time. It's in times like these, isn't it, that we can feel like that person or those people who are the kings on the board or play the role of king over our lives have the ultimate power over us. And it can feel at times like the rest of us can do nothing about it. And when their character is far from what we would call godly, it makes it even harder, doesn't it? And it just feels like we're just one or two moves away from being placed in a checkmate position and it's over for us. I mean, what can we ever do about it? But of course, there's another king on the board or actually hovering over the board, a divine king. So you see, while Xerxes is strutting his stuff, the divine king works behind the scenes. And the, the really interesting thing I find in the story is this divine king, aka God, is not mentioned anywhere in our story today. Uh, What's more, God isn't even mentioned in anywhere in the 10 chapters of this entire Bible book. No one even talks about him. No one prays. No miracles happen. No no prophets show up to deliver God's word. It's interesting, too, that this book is never mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Does that seem strange to you? Because this is a book in the Bible, isn't it? It's as if God went on holiday during the time of, of Esther. Does that confuse you? You know, confused a whole lot of other people in church history, so much so that nothing is written about the book of Esther for the first 700 years of church history. And then even in the 1500s, uh, you come across two pivotal characters in the Protestant Reformation known as John Calvin and Martin Luther, and both of them are asking some sinister questions about the book. And John Calvin preached like all the books of the Bible except Esther. And then Martin Luther was bold enough to say this, I am so great an enemy to Esther that I wish it had never come to us at all. I wish it wasn't in the Bible. You see, a lot of people through history are uncomfortable with this book being in the Bible. Because they look at what's going on in the story. They look at the, 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 the pieces on the board and, the, and the, the muck that they cause, the messiness in people's lives and, and, and the ambiguous decisions even the so-called heroes in the story might make. And it doesn't look like God is present in the story at all. So why no mention of God? Why is the book even in the Bible? Well, well, I think it's all deliberate. I I think there's no mention of God in the story because this is how the people at the time felt about their situation. Uh, The times looked so bad, they looked so appalling, it looked like these these people like King Xerxes were in charge, they couldn't do anything. God couldn't be present in this situation, could he? I mean, how can God be present when powerful, ruthless immoral, selfish leaders like Xerxes are able to parade their power and make decisions and drunken rages that harm so many. And yet as we see, and we're going to see throughout this book, there are a whole range of what you might call you know, coincidences that take place. 
We're going to unpack some of these in the weeks ahead, but I'm hoping you're going to take some time this week to begin reading the story of Esther. It's kind of like your homework for this week. And as you read, I want you to pay attention to some of these coincidences. I mean, we look out for the king's restless sleep and what he kind of happens to read in his bedtime story and how, how that ultimately leads to a man named Mordecai being honored on the very day he was meant to be hanged. The timing is just too coincidental. And you sit back and you go, way to go, God. And then as you read, I want you to to look out for a pair of dice that are thrown to determine the date that Haman's planning for the execution of the Jews across the entire Persian Empire. And notice the way the dice just happened to fall on the eve of Passover, a feast when the Jews remembered how, how God rescued them from another predicament, dangerous time for them in Egypt. Is it coincidence? that the very date for execution would be at the very time that the people of God remembered God's amazing, powerful work on them in the past. A a time when people are beginning to ask, can God do it again now in our lives for us? And you sit back and you go, way to go, God. And and then look out for a question that Mordecai raises with Esther. It's, It's on the bookmark in front of you. Take it, have another look at it. So question Mordecai says to Esther, what if you were placed here for such a time as this? In other words, maybe it's not like all random that you find yourself in this position on the board. Who knows if you were placed here for such a time as this? Maybe somebody's working behind the scenes and you found yourself in this position and you feel powerless and you feel like there's nothing at all you can do, but maybe, maybe just by coincidence, something's happened ahead of time. You see, all these coincidences cause us as readers of the story to sit back and and we realize there's another king at work here. He's not one of the kings on the characters of the board, but, but he is outside of the board. It's like he's hovering over the board, standing over the board, unbeknownst to all of the characters in the story. Yes, Xerxes is king of the chessboard. He's the dominant character. He loves being in the spotlight. He expects to be in the spotlight. Uh, He has all power. He uses that power for harm. But here's the idea I want you to take away today. Every human power ultimately bows before the God of all power. And even though God might be silent and invisible, it's like he hovers above the board in such a way that people have complete freedom, but he's still in charge and he will protect his people. And every human power, including Xerxes, will ultimately bow before the God of all power. You know, of course, there's uh, some particular irony of the role that the king plays on the chessboard. I don't know if you've ever noticed this as a chess player. But officially, you know, the, the king is the most important piece, you know, as I said before, you know, infinite value, no value place, because it's seen as to be like, well, no value, infinite value for the king, because if you're in checkmate, well, you've lost. And while all the other pieces are, are, are assigned a value, the king has, you know, infinite value. And yet the king, ironically, is really the least powerful piece on the board, because the king is only able to move like one piece at a time. Uh, The queen's largely able to move wherever she wants. Uh, The bishops, the knights, the rook, they're able to move a long way too, but the king, king's only able to move like one move at a time, that's all. You see, like the king on a chessboard, Xerxes stands above the others. He he looks and acts all powerful or majestic. However, the, the story of Esther shows how he is utterly finite and at times pathetic. He's not only manipulated by other people on the board, he's ultimately undone by the true king who is all-powerful even when he's working behind the scenes. You know, friends, each week we're gonna be looking at a different chess piece in, in our story, looking at a different character in the story of Esther. Today we're looking at Xerxes. And I just want us to ask, what might this role of king say to you and me today? So first, Some of you here are in a position of power. You might be a CEO, might be a a general manager, you might be a team leader, you might be a senior pastor. Uh, Those of us in a position of power, we we set the the tone, the pace, the direction we, we employ, we set budgets, we make decisions. Other people are affected by the decisions that we make. And if you're in a position of power, here's the takeaway 
I have for you today as it is for me today. If you hold power, hold it lightly. You know, as leaders, it's easy to hear just how significant we are. It's easy to receive accolades. It's easy to receive praise for the successes that normally come from other people. It's important that we don't hear all the press releases or believe all the press releases about us. Uh, Yes, Xerxes was a great ruler. Yes, he had success politically, globally, economically, and culturally. But every power ultimately will bow before the God of all power. We're going to see how this is true for Xerxes. It's, It's also true for you. It's also true for me. Positions come, positions go. Leadership comes and leadership goes. If you hold power, hold it lightly. Hold it lightly. Some of you are not in a position of power. In fact, in in chess, as I mentioned earlier, that the pawn is the most common and least valuable piece. It's often considered a piece that's expedient to whatever strategy that you might have. You know, you might sacrifice the pawn in order to get ahead. It's actually the piece that most of you have, and it's how many of you will be feeling. It's it's easy at times, isn't it, to look at all the, the, the big players on this game of life and feel like you're nobody So what do you do when you're under somebody else's power and influence? If you're under power, treat it lightly. Don't lose hope. Don't become cynical and give up. Brother, brother, hold it lightly. Yes, there are powerful people making decisions that don't always have the ways of God in mind, but the story of Esther reminds us, should tell us that we never should lose hope. Because every human power ultimately bows before the God of all power. You know, I imagine this is something we all need to take away as we think about this next week or two with the elections. Next week, your party of choice might get in. If so, hold that power lightly. Don't put all your hopes in that leader or that party. Don't put all your confidence in people that hold power because ultimately every human power bows before the God of all power. And of course, it might also be that your party of choice might not get in. If so, treat it lightly. I don't fear too much, don't lose hope because ultimately every power will bow before the king of all power, the God of all power. And as we come to the end of this time, I wonder if you can take that chess piece that is on your seat, uh, and if, by the way, if you don't have one, grab one afterwards from another seat. Why don't you take that chess piece? Why don't you take the bookmark as well? And look at that question again, because this is a question we want to keep in front of you during this whole series. What if you were placed here for such a time as this? What, what if you were placed right where you are in your home, in your place of work, where you're studying, in your neighborhood, in your club for such a time as this? That if you're in a place of power, how might you bring flourishing to people and places in your home, in your place of work, in that club, in that school, in that neighborhood? And if you're not in a position of power, you might read that question and, and, and think, well, what, what can I ever do? Because I'm not the one who's in charge. I'm not the one who makes decisions. But friends, one of the things we're gonna see in this story is that even people who don't appear to have any power at all actually find themselves in a place that they can actually save the lives of up to numbers of people. And even people who don't look like the hero types actually become the heroes in the story. And so what if God has placed you right where you are for such a time as this? We're coming to a time now for prayer and communion. And again, I want to invite you to just hold on to that chess piece, hold on to that bookmark for a bit, just as a way of of dedicating yourself anew to God today, of surrendering yourself anew. I like to lead us in in a prayer, and as as you do, maybe just hold that piece as a way of saying, God, this is the place I'm in right now. It might be that that chess piece is quite significant, symbolic about where you're at, or perhaps you can think about a different chess piece that, that probably is more symbolic of your role in life right now. But I want you to bring that peace and just kind of lay it before God as a way of saying, okay, God, I'm bringing this power to you. Or I'm bringing this position I have to you. Or I'm surrendering to you and my hopes and dreams to you, knowing you, God, are the one who holds all power. Let's pray together. Our Father, some of us here in this room are in a position of power. 
would you help us to hold it lightly? Help us to learn from the way of Jesus who, who used power to serve, who used power to help and to renew all things. Help us to partner with what you're already doing in this world right now as you work to renew people and places everywhere. And so we surrender ourselves to you today again and anew and afresh. And some here in this room are not in a position of power. Would you help us to treat it lightly? Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, the King of all kings and the ruler of all rulers. Help us to see how every human power ultimately bows before the God of all power. And we express our trust in you again today. And if you're here today, just while we continue to pray, and you don't yet know Jesus, you might want to follow along in this prayer. Jesus, I want to learn from you. I want to experience a life that's truly life. And so I want to surrender myself over to you today that you would lead me and that you would be the King and Lord over my life. So Jesus, we're all here. And we want to look to you and say, you are the one who's majestic and all glorious, the one we want to follow. So we surrender ourselves to you. We pray you'd help us to see your work in our lives and in this world. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.